Welcome into Rob Rides Gen X Pop Culture. And today we're going to talk about the top 10 grossing movies of 1984 based on the U.S. box office results. 1984 was a great year for movies. There's so many wonderful movies. We're going to count down the top 10. Some of these top 10 movies, uh, one or two of them came out actually in 1983, but they came out so late in 1983 that they really hit big in 1984. And there's one or two of these movies that came out in late 1984 and would have been higher on the list. I'm also going to tell you about some movies that didn't make the top 10 uh, that are great as well. So let's get started with our, our first film here. Bear with me as I share our screen here. We're going to do this a little bit differently because I think it's a little bit better than um, my face being with the pictures. So coming in at number 10 is Romancing the Stone. And I love this movie with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner and Danny DeVito. It's a funny adventure movie that's kind of similar to an Indiana Jones movie, uh, to be honest. Uh, the screenplay was written five years earlier by Diane Thomas, who was a Malibu waitress at the time. And unfortunately, it was her only screenplay. Uh, she barely got to see the movie and have a little bit of a success because she died tragically in a car accident a year and a half after the film's release. So sad that we lost her because she gave us such a wonderful movie. But I love this movie. It's one of my favorites. A couple of interesting facts in addition to this are Sylvester so Sloan was originally considered for the role of Jack T. Colton. Can you imagine Sly in that role? I can't really imagine him in the role. Other actors uh, that were considered were Burt Reynolds, which would have been interesting, but I don't see him in that role. Clint Eastwood, Paul Newman, and Christopher Reeve. I think that uh, they nailed it when they picked Michael Douglas for this role. He's perfect in it. Uh, Joan Wilder, instead of Kathleen Turner, the other person considered for that role was Deborah Winger. I think Kathleen Turner is fantastic in this movie. She plays it really well, and it's, it's just an outstanding movie. Uh, just so you know, studio executives were so sure this film would be a flop that Robert Zemeckis was preemptively fired from directing Cocoon. That's how little they thought of this movie. Uh, it turned out to be such a success that Zemeckis was able to go forward with his own project, Back to the Future. So if we didn't have Romancing the Stone as a hit, we might not have gotten Back to the Future. Can you believe that? That's how the movie business worked, and that's how uh, Zemeckis was back in the day. Uh, he's a great director, and I'm so glad that this one worked out for him. All right, moving on along, Terms of Endearment. So Terms of Endearment is another movie that actually came out at the end of 1983, and it was still gaining a lot of traction in 1984. Uh, this was a mega hit uh, with several Academy Award nominations uh, starring Jack Nicholson. Um, and it's it's a kind of a, a romantic comedy. Uh, Brooks wrote the supporting role of Garrett Breedlove for Burt Reynolds, who turned it down. Yet another film that Burt Reynolds turned down. Well, wow, that's two in a row we've got here. Uh, he turned it down because of the verbal commitment that he made to appear in uh, Stroker Ace. Uh, there were no awards in Hollywood for being an idiot, Reynolds later said, of the decision. Harrison Ford and Paul Newman also turned down the role. Um, McLean and Winger reportedly did not get along with each other during production. Big surprise there, given their big personalities. McLean confirmed this in an interview that said it was very rough, shoot, chaotic, uh, like working with tension on the set. A lot of tension with, with those two. I'm working with Jack Nicholson. McLean said working with Jack was crazy, which I've heard many stories about working with Jack Nicholson over the years. I've heard that he's one of the most professional actors, though. He gets his lines right every time, and he's just amazing to watch from what I understand. Another interesting fact about this is the exterior shots of Aurora Greenway's house were filmed in Houston. The exterior shots of locations intended to be in Des Moines and uh, Nebraska were actually filmed in Lincoln, and many scenes were filmed on or near the campus of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Uh, while filming in Lincoln, the state capitol uh, winger met the governor and started dating him. So they dated for two years after that. So interesting facts about uh, this movie. It was one of those movies that garnered a lot of attention, uh, had some wonderful actors in it, and was nominated for several awards. All right. I 
num another hit coming in number eight. One of my favorite uh, Star Trek movies, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Uh, this movie is uh, spectacular. I remember going to see it with uh, my family in the theater. Uh, it was kind of the sequel to Wrath of Khan where Spock had died. And this was how do we bring him back? And it was a fascinating movie. It had the Star Trek charm. It had a uh, Klingon bad guy. It had the destruction of the Enterprise. It had just about everything. It even had some fun, cheesy one-liners in it. But here are some of the facts about it. Studio Chief Michael Eisner. Yes, the same Michael Eisner who went on to uh, become the president of Disney was reluctant to hire Nimoy because he mistakenly believed the actor hated Star Trek and had been de demanded in the, and that Spock be killed. Nimoy was given the job after persuaded Eisner that that was not the case. Originally, the Romulans were supposed to be the villains and not the Klingons, but Nimoy preferred the more theatrical Klingons, feeling the pursuit of Genesis was analogous with the Soviet race for nuclear weaponry. So that's kind of a, a Cold War feel that they had to it. Bennett took the opportunity to flesh out the alien race who he felt were ill-defined in the television series. Uh, the name of the class of the, uh, the ship, Bird of Prey, uh, remained unchanged, which is really cool. I do like the Bird of Prey that we got in this movie. I thought it was a little better than some of the uh, Bird of Prey ships that the Klingons had in the original TV show. Uh, Bennett and Nimoy used the open thread of Spock mind-melding with McCoy at the end of Wrath of Khan as a way to explain Spock's restoration. The idea and name of uh, Vulcan Katra came from Bennett's discussions with Nimoy. Uh, the actor referred to the producer to an episode of the series Amok Time, which is a fantastic episode. Check that out if you've not checking out the, the original series. The whole original series is fantastic, but Amok Time is a wonderful episode uh, that suggests that Bennett, a high level of spiritual transference among Vulcans. And so Rathacon coming in at number eight. I, no, the search for Spock. Rathacon would have been number one. Uh, search for Spock coming in at number eight here in our countdown. The next movie that came in at number seven is Beverly Hills Cop. And actually, Beverly Hills Cop came out in December of 1984. And it's amazing that it's at number seven for just a month's worth of box office results. Had you looked at the full tally of the entire box office, Beverly Hills Cop would be number one. That's how good it is. Eddie Murphy was spectacular in this movie. Uh, Judge Ryan Hold is great, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, incidentally, Beverly Hills Cop was part of the reason why Eddie Murphy couldn't do Ghostbusters. He had already agreed to do Beverly Hills Cop. That's one of the reasons why he couldn't do it. Uh, the first time in Beverly Hills Cop franchise uh, was it shot him to international stardom, and he won a People's Choice Award for favorite motion picture. He was also nominated for both Golden Globe Award and um, Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. Uh, Sly Stallone was originally considered for the part of Axel Foley, which would have changed the entire movie. <laughs> it would have changed it completely. I, I'm glad Andy Murphy did this movie. Again, we're seeing more of this with Sly Stallone uh, being considered for a couple of roles here, which is fascinating how he's related to a bunch of these movies um, and Burt Reynolds as well. Um, in one of the previous drafts written for Stallone, the character of Billy Rosewood was called uh, Siddons and was killed off halfway through the script uh, during one of the action scenes. Stallone had renamed the lead character to Axel Corbett uh, with the character of Michael Tredino being his brother and Jenny Summers playing his love interest. So, Stallone had a little bit of input in the screenplay, but ultimately he decided not to do it. Um, he had said that the script for Beverly Hills Cop would have looked like the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan on the beaches of Normandy. Believe it or not, the finale uh, was stolen, uh, was in a stolen Lamborghini playing chicken with oncoming freight train being driven by the ultra slimy bad guy, which, wow, that sounds pretty cool. Producer Don Simpson uh, let it be known that he didn't want to move forward with Stallone's revision since Stallone wasn't willing to negotiate the rewrite, which is fascinating. Um, Simpson and Bruckmeyer, who were the producers, convinced Eddie Murphy to replace Stallone in the film. 
prompting more rewrites. Besides Stallone and Rourke, other actors that were considered for the role of Axel Foley include Richard Pryor, which would be interesting, Al Pacino, James Caan, and again, Harrison Ford. And uh, Axel Foley, all those people turned it down. The final shooting draft of the script, which was extensively revised with Murphy's input, was not completed until the day production uh, began. So really big hit for Eddie Murphy. I'm glad Eddie Murphy did it. I think that um, he just was fantastic in the movie. And he did just a, an amazing, an amazing job at Beverly Hills Cop. It's one of my favorites. Uh, number six is Footloose. And Footloose was a fantastic movie. Uh, ahead of its time. Has a wonderful, incredible soundtrack headlined by Kenny Loggins' theme song. And some interesting facts about this. Did you know Tom Cruise and Rob Lowe were both considered for the part of Ren? I can't imagine either one of those guys is the, the head in this at all. It would have been interesting, but I don't know if they would have pulled it off the way Kevin Bacon did. Kevin Bacon was fantastic in this. Um, so the reason why Tom Cruise couldn't do it, he had done Risky Business, and that was part of the reason why they wanted him, but he was filming all the right moves. A low audition three times uh, and had the dancing ability and a neutral team look the director wanted, but injury prevented him from taking the role. Uh, Christopher Atkins claims that he was cast as Ren, but lost the role. Bacon had been offered the main role for Stephen King's film, Christine, at the same time, and he was asked to do screen tests for Footloose. He chose to take uh, the gamble on the screen test, and watching his early film, Diner, the director was persuaded the producers to go with Bacon. So Kevin Bacon got this and did it instead of Christine, and I think it was a really wise choice because – He's fantastic at Footloose, and I liked this movie. It was a lot of fun. Um, there was a girl across the street from me in Columbus, Georgia, that I had a major crush on. Her name was Christy Parrish. Uh, she always wanted to watch this movie on cable when it came on uh, when I lived in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, the film stars Lori Singer as the Reverend Moore's independent daughter, Ariel, uh, a role for which Madonna and Havilah Morris also auditioned. Uh, Valley Brunelli and Jennifer Jason Lee were also considered. Uh, Diane West appears as the Reverend's devoted yet conflicted wife, and she's really good in this as well. Principal photography began uh, in May of 1983 and was shot at very location, various locations in Utah. Uh, the high school tractor scenes were filmed in and around uh, Pay Vision and Payson High School. Uh, the church scenes were filmed at the First Presbyterian Church in American Fork, while the steel mill was in uh, Geneva Steel Facility in Vineyard, and Lahai Roller Mills were also locations where Bacon's character worked. Bacon briefly worked at the roller mill as research for his, his performance, so he actually worked at a mill. So check out this movie if you haven't seen it. It's great. Uh, I don't think the remake did it justice, but Footloose is just amazing. The soundtrack's even better than the movie. I love the soundtrack. Check out the soundtrack if you get it, get a chance because it had a couple of great hits. All right, the next movie is absolutely one of my favorite movies, the original Police Academy. Uh, Police Academy is just a hilarious cop movie, and it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, so many wonderful characters. Steve Gutenberg is amazing in it. Kim Cattrall... Uh, does a good job, and it's just a blast to watch. Um, some facts about it. Dom DeLuise was considered to direct the film, but unavailable. Hugh Wilson was hired as a director based on his success with WKRP in Cincinnati. Even though he's not familiar with many of the films of this type of comedic drama, drama he made his own changes to it. So uh, he was, uh, you know, immediately convinced to cut down on the sleeves. So there was, there was supposed to be a little bit more raunchy comedy originally, and Hugh toned it down a little bit. Uh, so what he did was he, he turned down some of the sex scenes, he turned down some of the other gratuitous scenes, and he tried to make a more wholesome comedy. Uh, the opening sequence was actually shot in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, the camera booth scene was shot on, 
on the Cherry Street Bridge in Toronto. The academy was previously the site of Lakeshore Pediatric Hospital in Ethel, Ethelbulk. I'm going to butcher that, but and says since become the Lakeshore campus of Humber College, which is fascinating. Um, they got the idea for the film when San Francisco, when in San Francisco for filming uh, the right stuff, they saw kind of a police academy and how it started to work. And he thought of, oh my gosh, what if we turn this into a movie? Um, a bunch of ludicrous looking dance police cadets were being dressed down by a frustrated sergeant is what they saw. Uh, they were an unbelievable bunch, including a lady who must have weighed over 200 pounds and a flabby man well over 50. Uh, he asked the sergeant about them, and he explained that the mayor had ordered the department to accept a broad spectrum for the police academy. Uh, we have to take them in, he said, and the only thing we could do is wash them out. So that's where they got the idea of the police academy. So they saw it in San Francisco. They saw they were taking local people who may not be in the right frame to take on a police officer's job. And that's where they got the idea for the film. Now I will tell you that police work is very serious and very uh, dangerous and uh, you do have to meet physical standards. So this movie is while a comedy uh, is not necessarily the real thing. Although there are probably some things that go on at police academies uh, that could be some hijinks that happen in this movie. Anyway, on to number four and number four, is a fantastic movie. I remember seeing it in the theaters, The Karate Kid. Now, I love The Karate Kid movies. Uh, I even love what we have now with Cobra Kai on Netflix. Uh, what a great series. If you haven't checked out the movies, check out the movies first and then check out Cobra Kai because it's kind of a continuation of these movies. And the first one is absolutely the best one. Uh, just a, a wonderful movie about bullying and a kid uh, learning to stand up for himself. And, of course, Getting the Girl, uh, starring Ralph Macchio and Pat Morita. Uh, Credit Kid is a semi-autobiographical story based on the life of its screenwriter, uh, Robert Mark Carmen. At age 17, after the 1964 New York World's Fair, Carmen was beaten up by a gang of bullies. He thus began to study martial arts in order to defend himself. Carmen was unhappy with the first teacher who taught martial arts as a tool for violence and revenge. So he moved on to study Okinawan. I can't pronounce that name of the type of karate, but Okinawan karate under a Japanese teacher who did not speak English. Uh, but I've been a student of, I can't pronounce the first name, but the last name is Miyagi, which is where he got Mr. Miyagi. So very interesting that it was based upon a true person and a true story. A number of uh, actors are considered for the part of Daniel, including Sean Penn, Robert Downey Jr., Charlie Sheen, John Cryer, Emilio Estevez, Nicolas Cage, Anthony Edwards, C. Thomas Howell, again Tom Cruise, and Eric Stoltz. Also, D.B. Swinney was concerned for the role as well. All those guys went on to become big stars. I really can't see anybody besides Ralph Macchio in that role, uh, but it was very interesting that all those stars uh, auditioned for it. Uh, what drew them to Ralph Macchio was his performance in The Outsiders. Uh, Macchio had stated that his performance as uh, Johnny in The Outsiders influenced the development of Daniel LaRusso in The Karate Kid, uh, which was fantastic. The studio originally wanted uh, the role of Mr. Miyagi to be played by Toshiro Mufun, who had appeared in Akura Kala's Falas, Rashomon, and Seven Samurai and The Hidden Fortress, but the actor did not speak English. Pat Morita later auditioned for the role and was rejected for the part due to his close association with stand-up comedy and the character Arnold on Happy Days. However, Morita grew a beard and performed his accent after his uncle, uh, basing him on his uncle for the role, and he was cast in the role. And I think Pat Morita was the perfect choice. Pat Morita before this was, he was on Happy Days, uh, he was a stand-up comedian, and this was a more serious role for him, and he did a great job. Uh, Crispin Glover was considered for the role of Johnny. Wow. Woo Whoa, let's stop there. George McFly as the bully? That would have been fascinating. I don't know if he would pull it off because I love William Zapka in this movie. William Zapka is amazing, and he does a great job as Johnny. He also does a wonderful job in Cobra Kai. Um, so... 
after his audition, Zapka saw Macchio, who noticed that Zapka um, had no previous experience training karate. He was a wrestler. Uh, when he was cast, Zapka was a wrestler with no previous training, like I mentioned. Uh, he later recalled his audition saying he was told uh, to act out a scene from the script while wearing a headband. He walked up and grabbed uh, John Abinson's and said, watch your mouth, hey hole He then exited the room and came back in, took his headband off, and said it was Johnny. So it's pretty awesome that he did that. Um, anyway, so that's how Zapka got the role. And Zapka is fantastic in this. Um, and they had some concerns about his age and his height, and Zapka responded, Bruce Lee was smaller than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, but he beat him in reference to Game of Death. And that kind of just really convinced him to uh, convince the directors to hire him for the role of Johnny. Helen Hunt and Demi Moore were also considered for the role of Allie. Wow, another two great actresses. Uh, but Elizabeth Shue was cast, and I had a crush on Elizabeth Shue back in the day. Who didn't? She was hot especially in this movie and Adventures of Babysitting. Uh, but she was great. Uh, she also is a Harvard graduate, if you can believe it. Uh, she was cast basically uh, because she had a Burger King commercial uh, that became widely popular in the 1980s. Uh, the film marks the debut role of Zapka and Shu. Uh, late in production, Valerie Harper was considered for the role of Lucille, but the studio later in installed uh, Rondi Heller for the role. And Rondi Heller does make an appearance in the Cobra Kai series as Daniel's mom. And she's fantastic in that role. I, I, I love her. She does a great job as a mom. Uh, I think she's just fantastic. On to our number three movie. So number three is a movie that I absolutely love. It's a horror comedy gremlins. And this movie was spectacular back in the 80s. I remember I had the graphic novel for the movie. Um, I loved watching it. I thought it was hilarious. So many funny scenes with the gremlins. Uh, watching Snow White, the hi-ho. Uh, you see the picture of them singing the Christmas carols. And this was just a spectacular movie. So the story was conceived by Chris Columbus. As Columbus explained, uh, his inspiration came from his loft. When at night, uh, what sounded like a platoon of mice would come out and hear them, he'd hear them skittering about in the blackness, uh, and it was really creepy. He then wrote a screenplay as a spec script to allow potential employers that he had writing abilities. So it was to show that he had writing abilities. The story uh, was not actually intended to be filmed until Steven Spielberg uh, took an interest in turning it into a film. As Spielberg explained, it was one of those original things I've come across in many years, which is why I bought it. Spielberg considered Tim Burton to direct the film after seeing his short film, Frank and Winnie, which is fantastic. Interesting. Phoebe Cates was cast as Kate, uh, Billy's girlfriend, despite concerns that she was uh, known for playing more risque parts, such as Linda Barnett in Fast Times at Richmond High. Spielberg urged the casting uh, for the relatively unknown Zach Gillian as Billy because he saw the chemistry between uh Gillian and Kate's during the auditions. So I thought it was brilliant casting. Both of them were fantastic in this. Uh, Gillian later uh, compared himself to Billy saying he was a geeky kid. Uh, being in the film was really kind of a dream given that uh, what he gets to do, what my character gets to do, blow up movie theaters, adding that he got to work with great people. Spielberg commented then when uh, Gallagher was testing with Kate's, that he's in love with her already, and he was now, uh, that's how he won the part. Kevin Bacon, again, another person that we've already mentioned, Ralph Macchio, Emilio Estevez, and Jed Nelson were also auditioned for that role, which is interesting. I mean, think about uh, any of those people um, in that role. It's fascinating to think about. Okay, on to number two. Our number two film on this list is Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Well, it's not my favorite. I remember going to it and being wowed by just the mystique. It was a completely different film than Raiders, but it still had one of my favorite characters of all time, Mr. Indiana Jones, right here, right behind me uh, in the poster for Raiders World of the Lost Ark. 
he's on this second adventure and it was actually a prequel. Uh, so it takes place a couple of years before Raiders does. So Spielberg later uh, recalled when he and Lucas first approached him for Raiders Lost Ark, uh, George said that if I directed the first one, I'd have to do a trilogy. He had three stories in mind. It turned out that George did not have these stories in mind and had to make up su subsequent stories. Good job, George, getting Steve to, to agree to three movies. Uh, both men later attributed the film's tone, uh, which was darker than Raiders of the Lost Ark, to their personal moods following breakups of their relationships. In addition, Lucas felt that he had it had it had to have a dark uh, film the way Empire Strikes Back was a dark second act to Star Wars. Uh, Spielberg had said the danger in making a sequel is that you can never satisfy everyone. If you give people the same movie with different scenes, uh, then they say, why weren't you more, more original? But if you give them the same character in another fantastic adventure, but with a different tone, you risk disappointing the other half of the audience who just wanted a carbon copy of the first film with a different girl and a different bad guy. So you win and you lose both ways. I think they made a good choice here uh, with a different adventure. It's really interesting to see uh, Indiana Jones in different settings and how they did it. So here's some more facts about it. Lucas set the film in an earlier year uh, to avoid repeating the use of Yahtzees because he can't say that word on YouTube. Uh, he wanted to bring Marion Ravenwood and Abner Ravenwood in, but considering uh, what he, the parts of the story, he just didn't think that they would fit. Uh, Lucas conceived of the opening chase sequence with Indiana Jones on a motorcycle on the Great Wall of China, followed by the discovery of uh, Jones on the motorcycle um, and also seeing a lost world with a hidden valley of dinosaurs, which is interesting because later on, Steven Spielberg did Jurassic Park. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Chinese government would not let them film in China, so they couldn't use that. And they had thought of using the Monkey King as a plot device as well, but couldn't do that either. Um, Lucas wrote a film treatment that included... Um, Haunted Castle in Scotland, but they decided not to use that as well. Spielberg felt it was too similar to Poltergeist, uh, so they settled for a demonic temple in India, which I thought it was the right choice. I thought it was very interesting. Um, so another fact about this movie, for the role of Willie Scott, more than 100, well, yeah, more than 100, more than 1,000, actually, actresses auditioned. Among the unknown actresses that auditioned the role were Sharon Stone, and uh, Kate Cashaw finally got it. Uh, she was discovered after a videotape test showing it to Harrison, and Harrison uh, thought that she did a great job. For the role of short round, casting director Mike Finn arranged open calls uh, for East Asian boys to come in and audition uh, for several roles, and Kay Hay Kwan's brother was supposed to be hired, but they liked him a little bit better and hired him, which is fascinating. Uh, Quan was fantastic in the role, and Kate Cashaw was great as well as Willie Scott. And this movie was a lot of fun. It was really interesting. I remember as a kid, I was I was excited and kind of freaked out by the bad guy ripping the guy's heart out. That was that was so cool, but it was so gruesome, and I think it kind of made the film even more interesting. So uh, check that out if you haven't. Okay, before we get to our number one film, let's talk about some honorable mentions because we have several films in 1984 that were fantastic. So let me get my slides straight. So let me run down a few. Splash, uh, which is a hilarious comedy. Uh, the Natural, which is one of my favorite baseball movies, which you can see a review on my favorite baseball movies on my channel. Purple Rain by Prince, which is an interesting movie. It's a fantastic album, though. Uh, Prince's album, Purple Rain, is amazing. One of its best. Uh, Revenge of the Mer Nerds, a raunchy, funny comedy. Uh, that movie was so funny and so much fun. I had friends that always wanted to watch that every time we um, hung out. So it was great. Red Dawn is one of my favorite movies. I've got a review on it. It's it's wonderful. It's a very interesting movie. The Terminator, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Fantastic movie. I like it a little bit better than Terminator 2. And it's it's one of the scariest movies that I remember seeing because you thought that they killed the Terminator and then 
it's this gigantic robot, which just freaked me out. It was interesting and cool and kind of frightening at the same time. The Last Starfighter, which is a personal favorite of mine. I love the cheesy sci-fi-ness of this movie. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Scarface is, has become a classic for Al Pacino. Uh, what a great gangster movie. Sixteen Candles, uh, one of the first Brack Pack movies that was made. I talked a little bit about it uh, in my review of The Breakfast Club, but Sixteen Candles is a great movie starring John Cryer and Molly Ringwald, and it was amazing. Actually, John Cryer was in it. It was Anthony Michael Hall and Molly Ringwald. Sorry, John, I didn't mean to, to reference you in that. He was in Pretty in Bink. Uh, but Molly Ringwald, I definitely had a crush on. She was hot, and I thought this movie was a lot of fun. The Never Ending Story was a lot of fun during my childhood. Uh, one of my favorites uh, back in the day. Uh, very imaginative, very unique and interesting story uh, by a German writer. And it's, it's an amazing movie if you haven't checked that out. The 1984 version of Dune is my personal favorite of all the Dune movies. Uh, this one tells the complete story in one movie and does an amazing job. I love this version of Dune. It's great. Amadeus uh, is an interesting movie. It got a lot of awards. It was a very big movie for its time. Starman is one of my personal favorites. While it didn't do as well in the box office, I think it's a sweet story. I love Jeff Bridges in this movie. Uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a great movie. Uh, very tender, very interesting story. Check that out if you haven't. The Big Chill was another big movie uh, where the soundtrack was probably bigger than the actual movie. Uh, the soundtrack is amazing. Uh, but this movie is pretty good. It's it's an interesting one. Uh, it really goes back to the 50s and the 60s uh, and has some great music in it. Who could forget the movie that started all for Freddy Krueger, A Nightmare on Elm Street. An amazing horror movie that came out revolutionary for its time, spawned so many sequels and a fantastic, wonderful, funny and scary character. And then finally, uh, one movie that I really like because I want to be an astronaut growing up as a kid and I love movies about space or about the space race. And that was the right stuff. Uh, what an amazing, fun movie uh, that was. All right, let's get to our number one movie for 1984. And that is the one, the only Ghostbusters. And if you haven't, check out my review of Ghostbusters. I've already reviewed it. Uh, what a fantastic movie this is. And just a couple of facts about it. If you want to know more about it, check out my video on Ghostbusters, which I'll link uh, right here as well. Ghostbusters was inspired by Dan Aykroyd's fascination and belief in the paranormal, uh, which he inherited from his father, who wrote a book, A History of Ghosts. Um, Aykroyd was really influenced by this. He is very into the supernatural and he channeled that plus uh, your old comedies, Abbott Costello, Hold That Ghost, Bob Hope, The Ghost Breakers, and The Browery Boys, Ghost Chasers, all inspired him on this movie. Uh, he wrote the script and intending it for Eddie Murphy and John Belushi. Unfortunately, John Belushi died uh, while Dan Aykroyd was still writing the script and when he came to time to do the movie, he turned to one of his Saturday Night Live alumni friends, Bill Murray, who agreed to do the film. He still wanted to try and get Eddie Murphy for a role, but unfortunately, Eddie Murphy had gotten involved with Beverly Hills Cop, and that was prim his primary reason why he couldn't do Ghostbusters, because he was involved in Beverly Hills Cop. Harold Ramis came on to touch up the screenplay, and it was decided that Harold Ramis would uh, join in and become Ghostbuster as well. And so the characters were like this. Uh, Remus's character would be the brains of the Ghostbusters, kind of like the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. Aykroyd was the heart and Murray was the mouth. Uh, so it's interesting how they kind of had this, these three guys that kind of made up uh, the Ghostbusters cast. Also uh, bringing in the character of Winston uh, halfway through the film, Ernie Hudson does an amazing job here, and Ernie Hudson's great in the sequels. Uh, I think he was a great addition to the cast as well. This movie is great. Uh, it's one of the best movies of 1984. I would say that Beverly Hills Cop probably beat it in revenue overall, but if you're looking at just the 1984 box office, uh, you've got it. The other thing with Ghostbusters that was interesting, it came out right at the heart of the Olympics, and there was some concerns 
that it would not perform as well due to the Olympic Games. However, people would watch the Olympics and then go out at night and go see Ghostbusters. So the Olympics really didn't do anything for it. Uh, so anyway, that's the top 10 of 1984. What are some of your amazing, what other movies do you like for 1984? Do you like this list? Do you like the movies in this list? Share your comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of Rob Wright's Gen X Pop Culture.